Today we're going to look at one of my favorite examples and ideas in linear algebra. So it's not super complicated, but I think it's beautiful because it ties together a lot of different subjects. And so in particular, we're going to look at some calculus operations via the structure of linear algebra. So let's start by defining this three-dimensional vector space P2. And this is just simply the space of all polynomials of degree two or less. So it's polynomials that are degree zero, so those would be like constants. Degree one, those would be like linear polynomials. And finally, degree two, those would be quadratics. We can write those in general as follows. We have ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are over are. So we're working over the real numbers here. And the big idea behind this whole video is that every linear transformation on a finite dimensional vector space can be represented by a matrix. And before we get started, I'd like to point out I've got a second channel called Math Major where I go over in-depth full courses that you would see as an undergraduate studying mathematics. And I've got a whole course of linear algebra that's being built right now. Okay, so anyway, let's get into our example, or our first example, built off of this polynomial vector space P2. So, maybe the most classic thing to do with this first, since we're thinking about calculus, is to see what the derivative operator does. So, in particular, what we're doing is looking here at P2 and thinking about a map that goes from P2 to P2, which is given by the derivative. So, this is maybe a picture over here of the spaces, and over here I'll do a picture of the elements. So an arbitrary element in P2, like we've written over there, is ax squared plus bx plus c. Now, what does the derivative do to that? Well, I think we all probably know the derivative rules as they're applied to polynomials. So this gives us 2a times x plus b, just using the power rule. Now, next up, we'd like to use this little fact right here, that P2 is a three-dimensional vector space. So that means there's some sort of obvious way to match this with R3. So let's match this obviously with R3 in both places. And how could we obviously match it with R3? Well, maybe these powers of x could just be the basis vectors. So one way to do that would be to match ax squared plus bx plus c with the vector a, b, c. So let's notice that that's most definitely in R3. Okay, and then let's do this over here as well. Notice this is the vector 0, 2ab, because there's no x squared term. Now the real question is, can we complete this arrow on the bottom so that we can map from that three vector to that three vector? And we can, and it's pretty easy to check that it's the following matrix. So the first row is all zeros. So that's pretty obvious because this first row, when it flips and multiplies into this column, we need all of those to give us zero. And so that's what we have. Then what about this second row? Well, we'll have a two here, a zero here, and a zero here. That's because we need two times A, and then we don't need any contribution from B or C. And then likewise for this last row, we have 0, 1, 0, because we don't need any contribution from A or C, but a single contribution from B going right there. So maybe we could call this matrix D and then put the map over here that goes from R3 to R3 defined by D. And so that would make this into something called a commutative diagram. So in fact, what we've done is found or represented this derivative operator, which we know is a linear operator from calculus one as a matrix, as promised by this big idea. So let's do one more example in this space of polynomials before we move on to another example. And so maybe other than taking the derivative, the most classic thing to do would be to take the antiderivative. Taking the antiderivative is a little bit problematic because that'll give us a cubic polynomial. We could change the codomain to cubic polynomials, but maybe instead of taking the antiderivative, we will take a definite integral over a certain interval. Maybe the interval zero to one. 
and that'll make everything work out kind of nicely. So that'll give us a map from P2 to the real numbers, and I'll just say that this map takes inputs, so I'll make maybe make a little box here for my inputs, and it integrates them over the region between 0 and 1. So again, that's a linear map that's kind of well known to be a linear map. And then, furthermore, we can match this with R3, just as we had done up here. Now let's see what's happening with elements over on this side. So if we start here with ax squared plus bx plus c, so it's pretty easy to take the antiderivative and then plug in. Actually, we only need to plug in the number 1 because plugging in 0 will always give us 0. So the antiderivative of x squared is 1 over 3 times x cubed. So this is going to give us a over 3. Likewise, it'll give us b over 2 and then plus c. So again, that's just by taking the antiderivative. So notice we've got a real number here. That means we don't need to complete this into a rectangle. We probably just need to complete this into a triangle. So let's see maybe how that would go down here. We would match this to the same vector, a, b, c, and then we need to figure out a way to match a, b, c up with this a over 3 plus b over 2 plus c. That's not too hard. We have have a, let's see, it's a three by one matrix here. So in order to do that, we need to multiply by a one by three matrix. And that one by three matrix will be made up of one third, one half, one. So it'll be that matrix right there. Then maybe we could give this a name. Maybe we could give this the name I for integral. And then that would complete this diagram right here. This would be I. And again, we've completed a commutative diagram that represented this linear operator on this vector space of polynomials as a matrix. In this case, it's just a matrix with a single row, but that's okay. All right, let's get rid of this and we'll do another example. So for our next example, let's change the vector space that we're working with. We'll set V equal to the span of e to the x times sine x and e to the x times cosine x. So recall that the span is just all linear combinations of these two functions. So this is clearly a two-dimensional vector space because we have two basis vectors here. So now let's do the same kind of thing. So let's take V and map to V via the derivative. And then V should be able to be matched with R2 now. And so now it's R2 because it's a two-dimensional vector space. And furthermore, this V should also be able to be mapped with R2 or matched with R2. And then we should hopefully be able to complete this with another matrix, which I'll keep calling D because it's related to the derivative. So now our goal is to find what this matrix is. So let's do that just looking at what our derivative does to an arbitrary um, element from V. So notice an arbitrary element from V looks like this. We have A e to the x sine x plus B e to the x cosine x. So like I said, that's an arbitrary element from V. It's a linear combination of those two vectors. Now, if we take the derivative here, we have to be a little bit careful with the product rule because we have e to the x times sine x and e to the x times cosine x. But what we'll end up with is the following. We'll have a minus b e to the x sine x plus a plus b e to the x cos x. So why is that? Well, we get this a times e to the x sine x from taking the derivative of e to the x from this term. We get the negative b from taking the derivative of cosine for this term. And then likewise, the other portions of the derivative give, a, give us this over here. Now we'd like to make kind of an obvious matching of this element with something from R2. And we'll take maybe the simplest matching, which is just a, b. So that means e to the x sine x is playing the role of 1, 0, and e to the x cosine x is playing the role of 0, 1. Okay, so that means over here we have a minus b, a plus b. So let's see, that's the matching here. So now we just have to figure out what matrix 
takes a b to a minus b a plus b. That's actually not super hard to write down. So notice the first row needs to be one minus one. And that's because when we swivel this first row into this vector, we get one times a minus one times b, add them up and we get a minus b. Then furthermore, this second row needs to be one, one. And then maybe we'll call this D. Now let's notice that this example is a little bit different than the last one in that taking the antiderivative makes sense. And furthermore, taking the antiderivative should be the opposite of taking the derivative, which means it should be like finding the inverse of D, which is totally possible here. Again, because taking the antiderivative of an object like this will produce another object that looks like this. But also from a linear algebra standpoint, taking the antiderivative should be the same thing as applying this D inverse operator. Well, let's maybe note that we can take D inverse to be equal to, well, we can just write down the inverse formula for a two by two matrix. So we need one over the determinant. So notice the determinant is one half. So we can see that that's this times this. So the diagonals multiplied, the off diagonals multiplied, and then you take a difference. Now we swap the diagonals and negate the off diagonals. So that's our formula for the inverse. Okay, so now let's say our goal would be to apply this rule to calculate the antiderivative of e to the x sine x dx, which in general takes quite a few steps. You might have to do integration by parts a couple of times. You might have to solve for the original integral. It's kind of a pain. But with this trick, it actually goes pretty quickly. So let's match this with, um, let's see, D inverse applied to one zero. So we match it to D inverse applied to one zero because taking an antiderivative is like the opposite of taking the derivative. But let's notice that that is equal to one half, one, one, minus one, one times the vector one, zero. I guess I should point out we're using the vector one, zero here because e to the x sine x corresponds to the vector one, zero by how we've uh, chosen this map. But now we can do matrix multiplication here and matrix multiplication will give us one half times the vector one minus one. But now we can push that back into our function space. And if we push that back into our function space, we see this is one half e to the x sine x minus e to the x cosine x, because we have a one in the e to the x sine x portion of the vector and a minus one in the e to the x cosine x portion of the vector. But that's exactly what we need to end with to finish this whole diagram. And we've easily calculated the antiderivative of e to the x sine x. You might say that we're missing a plus c. And from a calculus point of view, we are missing a plus c. But in terms of this vector space and our interpretation, there are actually no like free constants in this vector space because one of the basis vectors is not equal to the number one. So we're in fact not really missing a plus C in this context. Okay, that's a good place to stop.